Hello, my name is K.R. King. This is my YouTube channel dedicated to homebrewing a D&D campaign. I've been playing D&D since 1975. It's the greatest game ever invented. Combined storytelling, role-playing, you have battles, action, uh, great storylines that evolve over time that the players can actually uh, influence and create. Uh, and the greatest way to play D&D, in my mind, is to homebrew a campaign. Uh, that gives the player characters the most opportunity to affect the course of play. And oftentimes people say, well, I'd love to homebrew, but I, I, I don't have the time. Uh, it's, it's overwhelming. I've got to create this whole world. I've got to create everyone. And it's too much for me. Uh, I'm not able to do it. I'm here to say you can do it. You can create a homebrewed campaign. I've done it the past 40 years. I've developed some techniques I have to start small, to think about characters and their desires, to think about storylines in terms of evolving from how the players, when they start at whatever level, uh, move up. Because the thing is, we need more homebrewed campaigns. We need more characters. We need more storylines. We need you to create a homebrewed campaign. So now we're going to start our process of building a, a homebrewed campaign, one that I've done many times. I've played all the different editions of D&D. I'm going to be using the 5th edition rules uh, when we start to get into the mechanics of encounters, monsters, and the NPCs. I'm doing that because I think that's the most popular form right now. It's the one I'm playing right now. Uh, but all this stuff is pretty much applicable to any system. And what we're always going to be emphasizing is having fun. In other words, you're going to have fun while you're making your campaign, while you're creating uh, your NPCs and your encounters and your special items. You want your players to have fun when they're playing the game, when they're interacting, when they're creating, helping you create some of the scenarios, how things unfold. Thing is, it's a game and you want to have fun. And sometimes you find yourself in a situation playing D&D where you're not having fun. Sometimes it's the players don't get along. Sometimes the players have a different idea of what d and is about. They're competing with the game master. Sometimes the game master is competing or he has something against. There's all sorts of variants. Um, and I know there are players that you can't play with. They don't want to have fun. They want to uh, do their own thing. Uh, again, they're, they're hostile to one another. I get that. You can't play with them. But if you have a group, a solid group, that's really invested in playing, really invested in taking part in your world, and you're not having fun, then you got to look at yourself. You got to think, you know, are these encounters uh, fair? Are the puzzles too easy? Are the puzzles too hard? Uh, are, does it seem boring to the players? Are you trying to control them too much? Are you trying, you're not giving them enough clues as to what to do next or what they might uh, encounter or discover? So then that's going to be a thing constantly through this process of making sure we're having fun. The way I think uh, in terms of running a great campaign, a homebrewed campaign, and the players enjoying themselves is to always emphasize characters and their desires and motivations over just plot. The desires and motivations of your characters in your world are going to drive the storylines. And when I say characters, I mean NPCs, and I also mean any sentient uh, humanoids or monsters, anywhere from an Umber Hulk to a Mind Flayer. Obviously, an Umber Hulk's desires and motivations are going to perhaps be more limited uh, than a Mind Flayer's, but still, uh, they live in the world. This is very important. And sometimes people forget that, that the characters in a story uh, have a life before the action of the story begins. They, have, uh, they know things about each other. They know things about the world. And player characters have a certain knowledge about the world because they grew up here, but so do the non-player characters, so do the monsters. They know the area around them. Uh, they know what's been going on, the history. Uh, they have objectives in terms of that knowledge. When you do this, when you emphasize characters, desires, and motivations, when you try to make them as real as possible, this will have your player characters become invested in the world because they will realize this is a real world. And when they realize that their actions are going to influence the behavior of these NPCs or monsters or whatever long term, not just going out and killing them, but if they encounter them and they uh, run away or they escape or the monsters run away, again, the NPCs, whatever might happen in the world, it changes things. The moment your characters encounter an NPC, a monster, in some situation, time starts with them. They begin to react to what happened in this encounter. And this is the organic process of D&D that makes it the greatest game. The players affect the world 
simply by behaving in that world. They are the agents of change. They are the agents in which other events, other NPCs begin to react to things. Before the players meet them, they tend to be stationary. You've set them up unless they hear about something that the player characters are doing. This is why the player characters are the center of action. This, again, is why it's so fun to play D&D, because you are seeing yourselves, if you're a player character, influencing the world and changing things. So we're really going to emphasize characters, their desires, their motivations when we're creating the world, when we're thinking about encounters, when we're thinking about each run. We're also going to be always balancing verisimilitude versus the suspension of disbelief. So verisimilitude is simply how much like real life are the characters and situations that we encounter in this world. How much can we relate to it? How much does it make sense? Now, of course, there is a suspension of disbelief. Uh, We're in a fantasy world. People are throwing spells, we have fantastic monsters, we're breaking the laws of physics right and left. We also have a suspension in disbelief in terms of storytelling in which we've all heard truth is stranger than fiction. We have rules of storytelling that we adhere to that don't really apply to real life. We have coincidences in real life. In in fact, you can find all sorts of incredible coincidences. But if we have those kind of things or, you know, a sudden ending to something that doesn't make sense... People complain about it. People say this isn't the way uh, stories should work. This is, it lacks verisimilitude. They're not going to suspend their disbelief beyond the rules of storytelling. And we're going to talk about that when we're building encounters, the storylines of our uh, the, the NPCs and the way cities have developed. We're going to be thinking about balancing uh, the, the verisimilitude and also suspension of disbelief in terms of having fun. The characters are the center of the world. They're the ones that are going to be meeting the leaders of these places and being asked to do tasks and other things that uh, in real life might be a little unrealistic. So that balance is going to be really important. We're also always going to be thinking when we're creating the world that this is a game. This is a game with rules that constrain the action. So, for example, when we create our map, we're going to be thinking about a hex structure. When the players are moving on the map, we're going to be making sure that we have them map their progress, know how much time has gone by. When we have battles, again, this is my view of this. You can also not adhere to this if you want. You can take some other things that I have. But I always say uh, that you need to use miniatures. You need to have a board out uh, with squares and everything. Uh, We used to say, again, this is my... Uh, you know, get off my lawn kid moment. When we used to run in people's campaigns years ago and you'd ask about how was so-and-so's campaign? And they would go, he doesn't use miniatures. And we were always like, ooh, okay. Because that means that the battles and everything are not constrained by the rules. The dice, the dice can be your friend, both good and bad. Sometimes the rolls go with you, sometimes they go against you. But if you don't use the dice or if you don't have miniatures to really see where we are in space in this battle, uh, the ranges of spells, if it's all just sort of talk through, you know, theater of the mind. And again, if you like that way, go for it. But when I set up my world, I'm thinking about the fact that we're going to use miniatures, our battles, our encounters. When we explore, you know, a dungeon or a cave complex or a city, we're going to have some sense of this in terms of the game. Because again, the dice are your friend. The dice are a neutral arbiter, chance. Again, you modify your, your chances, you know, with the buffs and uh, certain spells and, you know, strategy in terms of a battle, where you are tactically in the battle. You modify roles as much as you can. But in the end, the roles determine things. The roles force you to make new decisions. You know, you may in fact have some incredible encounter come down to one role. The old, I'm rolling in front of the screen right now, folks, and you're player characters realize, "Uh uh-oh, he's not going to fudge this one. This is for real, right? And those are exciting moments because it is the role. I'm saying to the players, we're going to have chance to decide this. We've we've put together all our stuff here, all our buff. We've done the best we can, and it's come down to this role. Very exciting. So the final thing that I'm always going to be stressing is keeping it simple. You're going to want to start with a small area Uh, a few settlements, coastline, maybe 100 miles by 150, something like that. Uh, You're going to just do the major cities and some geographic locations. You're going to concentrate on enough of the personalities of those cities so that the players have a sense of what they would know as people that had grown up in this town. And then you're not going to worry about too much more. You'll have high-end concepts. You'll have uh, secrets and mysteries and and maybe some you know plot line that's going to evolve over the course of the campaign just sketched out. You don't have to develop it completely. We're also going to have a sandbox campaign in which the players can go wherever they want. And that, of course, creates an organic uh, development of the campaign for you 
as the game master, but you're going to show them, you're going to say, in this corner of the sandbox are all sorts of great toys. You can build sandcastles. You can have a lot of fun. In this corner of the sandbox is a big thing of mud, a big puddle. There might be something at the bottom of that puddle, that mud pile, but you're going to get dirty. And then in this corner of the sandbox is a big old pile of razor wire. If you go into that razor wire, you're going to get cut. You're going to get hurt. But there could be great rewards there. So you've got to get to the point where now I can go into the razor wire. If players realize that, if they get a sense of how your campaign works, what the threats are, how dangerous things really are, what happens when they decide before they're ready to go into the razor wire, uh, they'll go in the direction that you may want them. But they might not. We're going to talk about improvising, how to create situations, how to have situations set up if you need to improvise. So that's going to be our basic format. We're always going to be trying to have fun. We're always going to emphasize character. We're always going to think that these characters, NPCs, monsters, whoever live in this world, they have a history in this world, they have connections with one another. We're going to always create our world constrained by the rules, thinking about miniatures, thinking about how the die rolls can be our friend, and we're going to keep it simple. Okay, so... The first thing we got to do is come up with a concept for our world. And that'll be our next episode. 